Welcome to Conversations Live, where we bring you the best in music, books, entertainment, and more. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Now celebrating 16 years of broadcasting, here's your host, Cyrus Webb. And welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again, both for our radio audience and those tuning in online. We're glad that you all could be with us. Adam Cruz is making his first appearance on our program this year to talk to us not only about his own love of music, but also the journey he's been on as a DJ, a producer, and the author of a book called Free the Music Business, Tips and Tales from an Indie Music Nerd. We'll talk to him about that journey, what it's been like for him to share a bit of his own story with the world, but also the, the business of music and what a lot of us may not think about about, especially those of us who are not in the industry when it comes to music, especially the way that we're listening to it today. If you guys are just now finding out about the book, I'll let you know at the end of our segment how you can be able to get your own copy of it. But Adam, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Cyrus. Well, look, glad to do it. So let's kind of begin with the interesting thing about Freedom Music Business. Yes, it is a look at the history of music, but also you're giving us an insight into you, Adam, and your own journey. I mean, what was that like for you to kind of think about your own life, where you are, and the role that music has played in your life? Well, uh, I'm one of those, uh, I call myself an indie music nerd because from very little, I was always, always fascinated with music how it was put together. Uh, I was into the liner notes. If you would buy records, you would pull out the jacket sleeve or look at the back of the vinyl, and you would read the credits. I was that kid that I would pour through all of the credits. So I knew that I had a, an affection for music that might have been unlike others. But where uh, when I grew up, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, until I was 10. I grew up in New York, but grew up in New Jersey. And uh, growing up, the way to be cool was to know the latest dance steps and, of course, to know the latest music. So right away, I, everybody around me was into music, so I wasn't an anomaly that way. But uh, my dad, unfortunately, t- died very early in my life. Uh, he died tragically in a car accident. And what I realized after he passed when I was eight, he, uh, his accident started when I was uh, at around seven, and he was in a coma for over a year. When he, when he passed, it was obviously a very sorrowful time, but I noticed that the music started to speak to me. And what I mean by that is uh, I could all of a sudden feel a certain mood, and it was like the lyrics in a song were spoke to me. And so I understand intellectually now as an adult that you could resonate so much with music just by listening to a, a pattern in a groove or a lyric. But as a kid, it really was profound. It changed me inside that I could have this kind of, interpersonal relationship with music that uh and it formed like a healing a therapy for me when it was really down and out it really helped me to lift my spirit so it was really important music always has been really important you bring up a really good point, and you actually talk about that early on in the book, uh, Adam. Uh, in the Free the Music Business, Adam, in talking about that time with his father, uh, said this about the power of music. Music was a great way to deal with the immense pain of having lost my dad uh, in this long, drawn-out and brutal way. I needed therapy but didn't seek counseling. I was a kid with no choice, no real choices, but it just wasn't a thing to be to do back then. I used music. I remember the lyrics of the songs I loved and even the songs I hated. And, and, and I think it's so funny because when I read that, Adam, I think we all do that, right? If we're in love, if we're having you know, a certain feeling, we look to music kind of as that therapy. And it really shows the power of music. You also talk about in that early chapter of the book about the power of hip-hop, right? So, so do you think then it was almost inevitable that music would find itself as a part of your life professionally? Yes, I just feel like it was always going to be sort of a hand in hand. Every step, every step that I was taking in my life, and to, it's worth mentioning that I had an older cousin, about seven or eight years older than me, that was a DJ in the Bronx, and I would visit the family often, and I was just enamored by he and his friends who were also DJs. So if you can imagine, I'm dealing with the death of my dad, and then my cousin. Uh, in short order, decides he's he's just giving up DJing, and he gives me his equipment. So that was like the very pivotal moment for me because now it was not just using music as therapy, but I could use music, uh, I could use DJing as instruments where I could take one song and play it against another using two turntables and make like a new song from these records just by blending them together. So that like blew me away, you know. So I think that was really important. 
And I think, too, as time goes on, again, while a lot of us are just thinking about music and what we can take away from it, I mean, you were also being able to be put in a position, Adam, where you're thinking about the dollar and cents of it as well. And I love the fact that you kind of talk about that in the book because it, it brings up a conversation, that, of course, that has been going on for decades, and that is, of course, the, the money that these artists make. We've all heard these horrible stories, right, of these artists who are such, you know, big stars, supposedly, um, as far as being known to the world, but as far as the money that they're making, how they're able to survive, uh, doesn't seem to equate with that. And, and you, t- you kind of give some of the history as well, going back to uh, the early 2000s even, uh, and what was happening with Apple, and, and when it comes to the profits, what made you so interested in that aspect? Because you mentioned, of course, you know, the, the relative being a DJ, you're, you know, you are also, you know, was able to follow in that path. You also a radio personality yourself. What made you so interested in the business of music? Well, I, uh, I started working for record labels. And then when you start to work for record labels, you understand the different angles of what makes the business the business, so to speak. So I think by the time I got into the dollars and cents of it all, uh, I was running a disco label. And the disco label had sort of two personalities, if you will, uh, a past and a present. So the past was dealing with reissuing vinyl, which was uh, catering to its older audience of a lot of disco lovers. And then I had to deal with the quagmire, which is how do you take an old company and make it new again in the, in the turn of the century? So uh, I think that gave me this sort of perspective of, wow, the return with every vinyl copy I sell to a distributor versus how much I make back to the label from a download uh, perspective that like that I was synced into right away um, also because part of my job was to deal with royalty administration so I was quite literally the person that would send you the royalty statement and say this is how much we owe you so it was quite literally very important uh, to my job that I understood the math of everything and so it blew my mind that no one was really talking about the long-term effects of what digitization would, would be. Uh, the, really, the issues were, seem to be more trivial now when you think about it. Like Apple, for example, uh, in order for the labels to buy into uh, Apple in terms of letting the music be sold there, their biggest issue, the labels, were how many times can a person burn a copy of a song they download onto CD? Can you imagine if in this day and age we were considering <laughs> CDs like that? But that was really right. their biggest, one of their biggest fights. So my point is that they had no foresight, no ability to foreshadow. They had no, nothing, no thought about what does this really mean? I mean, think about it. At this, before this happened, you bought an album, and maybe one or two of the songs you might have loved, but maybe most of them you didn't care for, but you bought the whole album. You were yeah. forced to. Now in this, uh, in this new paradigm, you basically have the ability to download per track. And that changed everything. Yeah. And you talked about that as well. I, you know, I should say for full disclosure, Adam, my regular audience knows this, Amazon is one of our advertisers. So Amazon is where uh, we get our music here at Conversations Live. However, you talk about in the book about the power of some of these other platforms like Spotify and even YouTube. And you, you bring up an interesting quote in connection with this conversation about the labels. Uh, the, the quote was, if we don't learn from the sins of our past, we're doomed to repeat them. But you were talking about the labels and their lack of, of thinking this through. You wrote, the labels didn't have enough forethought and knowledge about the benefits of digital music access. I think today in the world that we're in today, I think that definitely <laughs> has changed. But what was it like for you to kind of see the evolution, Adam, of how not only the world kind of viewed uh, going from, because I still know people who love their beloved vinyls and will go after those, but what was it like for you to kind of see the evolution to digital? I think I saw it as an, to be honest, I saw it as an opportunity initially because uh, the label, like in the disco label that I'm talking about is West End Records. And West End at that time, when I was trying to deal with the sort of two sides of West End, uh, I understood that there was power in trying to pull together other people that were like us, other labels, and try to distribute their music digitally. So uh, very early on, I was trying to do what iTunes and other dance music websites took and ran with, which was sort of a boutique way to go to the main website and you could download not just our catalog, but others. Mm -hmm. So I just, I think we were always trying to, we were trying to say, 
there's this way in which both things could live, analog and digital, the vinyl and the, uh, the digital copy. Always we knew that the other mediums like CDs and the others were going to go more on the wayside, whereas obviously digital music was, was really becoming popular quickly. And I want to fast forward time, uh, Cyrus, to mention this, that when we look at all the studies and the research, there is a level of permanence that has happened in the marketplace. What do I mean? It means that now uh, there used to be this issue of, well, if one new medium comes out, CDs, it's going to make the vinyl extinct. Do you remember that? That when right. Laserdisc tank came out, that maybe they thought VHS were going to be out the door. And there's always these sort of speculation that goes back and forth. But really what you see is these two levels of permanence, vinyl and streaming. Uh, by all accounts, it looks like those two uh, modes of music consumption are here to stay. That's why they use the word permanence around it. It's because no matter what has happened, even as they chiseled away at physical goods, which included vinyl, vinyl uh, is still here. And it's, and it's become even more popular with younger people, which is a great sign for sustainability sake. And I think that is the cool thing about this conversation. I want to say for those who are just tuning in, it's on the radio side or online, you're listening to Conversations Live. Adam Cruz is our guest for this segment. Adam is known as a DJ, producer, a media personality himself, but also the author of the book, Free the Music Business, Tips and Tales from an Indie Music Nerd. We're going to remind you how you can get your own copy of the book. And and to that point, Adam, that you were just making about, um, you know, people, you know, thinking that, you know, we're going to lose these things forever. I do think there's the other side of this for the artists, right, for the creatives, and you talk about this in the book, is that, hey, I mean, it makes it a lot easier. Now they don't need a gatekeeper these days, especially, I mean, the world we're living in today with people can't get to studios these days anyway right now, right? I mean, they can literally be able to, as you talk about in the book, record projects on their phone. I mean, what has that been like for you to kind of look at where we now have gotten to, and when it comes to the artist, the opportunity that's available for them? To be honest, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that looks at this very optimistically. I suppose... Years ago, I was less so. But I feel optimistic because of a few reasons. I think that we're in a place now where artists can really innovate in ways that they never could before. You were kind of beholden to your major record label deals. You had to uh, allow for your marketing department or your merchandise folks to come up with things. And there was a lot of waiting around. There was not enough proactivity from the artist's perspective. Now, I feel like there's a lot of agility, a lot more innovation for artists. Uh, in particular, I want to point to two things that I think is important. Uh, I think it's important with every release that an artist puts out. If you're putting out something independently, that you ought to pair it with something. So that's a fancy way of saying just don't put something out for putting it out sake. Take the time to strategize around the release date. So if you know that you're going to kick off a tour of a few dates or maybe a, a couple of radio interviews, um, maybe you would time the release around the day of that interview. Maybe it's your birthday. Maybe it's Black History Month. Maybe it's Women's Month, National Women's Month, something like that. That's so there's a reason for the season, so that's pairing. The other thing that's important as an artist is you window. What does that mean? As an independent artist, you're going to look at all of the streaming services and decide by looking at the math which one has the highest rate of return. You know that ROI? What's that highest rate of return? And what you do is the one that has that highest rate of return for you is what you choose as window number one. That means you put it out on that website first. In my case, I have a lot of success with using Bandcamp, in particular because I'm not really promoting that I have a song on Bandcamp as much as I'm promoting my website because it's really a page on my website. So I go, go to my website, djadamcruz.com, and you can pick up my new single. And when they click, it happens to open the Bandcamp. Okay? So that, that is a great rate of return for me. It's the closest to a full dollar per download for me. Now, after that, I start to do the same process for other websites. Uh, for house music, which is my uh, genre of choice, if you will, um, I love to put music out on tracksource.com and on beatport.com. For you and your genre, if you're an artist, do the, do the math, do the research, and figure out, oh, where are the people most gravitating towards? And then that's where you would, be, you would choose as window number two. And then you would follow suit after that. And why do we call it windows? So that you understand you put out uh, the, the song on one platform, 
let it breathe for a couple of weeks or so. You keep driving traffic to that place. Then after that period ends and you put it out on window number two, then you, then you let that live for another couple of weeks or so, and et cetera, et cetera. So pairing and windowing is the name of the game. The last thing is to make sure that you have merch, something that they can buy from you that's not dependent just on streaming the song. Uh, the reality is that we are earning a fraction of a penny per stream, so that's not even a livable wage. So you need to pair with a physical good. Uh, and so most of us use merchandise or maybe – uh, our audience likes our music on USB. Maybe they want uh, a discounted entrance to a club night, something like that. Well, I tell you, and I think even that, what you just shared there, Adam, I mean, shows not only, of course, how you've been able to learn these things for yourself, but then, of course, sharing them with other people. I guess an obvious question would be, you know, you, the entertainment industry is not always known for giving information. <laughs> Why did you feel it was a responsibility for you to do that, to share what you had learned? I think because uh, it was literally just reading and reading and reading some more, and I started to connect the dots, and I'm like, why isn't and no one talking about the simple path that we've chosen for our music consumption? Um, and so I think that was the driving force is really a lot of reading. And then I started to talk a lot with other artists. And I was really surprised at how many artists just had never gotten a royalty statement from a label, um, had never heard back from their managers or whatever. So there was a lot of money out in the streets, as they say, for these artists. And they had no way to collect on what was owed to them. Um, and so I, even to this day, I provide a lot of advice and counsel uh, and ways people can get their money when it's out there. There's a lot of money out there, Osiris. Um, and so even Congress had to step in to deal with the, this missing income. And what I'm talking about now is mechanical royalty. That's that money per stream or per download. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, and the others have a terrible time with paying the rights owners for each of those songs whenever someone streams it. And so you would think, why is that? That should be simple. But it's not simple at all, unfortunately. A lot of the times, the metadata, that's that the, all the fields before you put a mu music out is not properly filled out. A lot of the inner workings, meaning the people that run things behind the scene at the labels, don't know how to fill out the information correctly. And what that spells is trouble, uh, where the income that's supposed to go to the rights holder is not paid out because they don't know who to pay. And that black box income or suspended income is what it's called has uh, amassed to the tunes of billions of dollars. So Congress has then to uh, charge a group with creating the MLC, which is called the Me Mechanical Licensing Collective. And their responsibility is for exactly what I've just described. How do you deal with uh, working with the copyright office and the streaming outfits and getting the rights holder paid? And so now hopefully the MLC is in the throes of uh, – building their base so that they could start this job. Well, I tell you, it's great to be able to have individuals like you who have this knowledge, Adam, and are sharing this knowledge and letting people know, not only for music lovers, but I think for those in the music business, especially those indie artists out there, about what they need to know, because you're able to take, again, what you learned at this label and in your life, and now to be able to share it with all of us. Again, everyone, Adam Cruz has been our guest. Free the Music Business, Tips and Tales from an Indie Music Nerd is the title of the book. It's available through our friends at Amazon.com, both in Kindle and in print. You guys can get it there. And speaking of websites, Adam, you mentioned it earlier. How can our audience stay connected with you? Yeah, so thank you for asking. So, yeah, I, um, I have a website, djadamcruzcruz.com. I also have a music business show where I talk all about publishing, copyright, that's uh, at freedomradiohour.com, also a YouTube channel of the same name. Um, and also I wanted to mention, because you mentioned beautifully the Amazon piece, which is the physical and Kindle copy is available on Amazon. But I have friends that are constantly on the go, Cyrus, and so they don't have time to read. So I did produce an audio book. So if you want, oh, nice. you can pick up an audio copy at Audible, which is a friend of Amazon as well. And then I also released a soundtrack of songs that were near and dear to me that I own the copyright to and that I could put together in a compilation. So the soundtrack is available on all platforms. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Adam. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for stopping by. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Cyrus. Take care. Yeah, you do the same thing. And we thank your audience for tuning in to another episode of Conversations Live. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. 
Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live. Let's make it a great one.